In 1922, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to young Danish scientist Niels Bohr. He worked toward understanding the structure of atoms. We seem to need only one more step to uncover the universe's microscopic underbelly. But 100 years later, in 2022, the Physics Nobel Prize was awarded to three scientists who studied quantum entanglement and proved the opposite thing. Namely, that the universe itself doesn't have the slightest idea what's going on with its smallest particles. Moreover, at a certain scale, reality doesn't exist at all. But how is that even possible? Alas, the more we try to plumb the fundamental laws of physics, the more bizarre our own world turns out to be. Up to the point where we start to doubt whether what we call the universe exists in the first place. Hidden from us, this part of the universe rattled Albert Einstein himself. Just think, yet another attempt to induce fusion ignition at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California ends up in its state-of-the-art laser's failure caused by an unforeseen quantum effect. This results in an extremely powerful explosion which raises the building to the ground with hundreds of its employees under the rubble. A few hours later, Washington officials issue a statement on the death toll in the terrible accident. Precisely at that moment, thousands of kilometers away, an unknown force materializes the dead and the survivors in California's hospitals. And before the casualties in the quantum explosion are mentioned in the news, all these people are neither alive nor dead. And it's not just figurative language, they literally aren't. Well, that's just impossible, you'll say. And Albert Einstein, along with an army of his fans, will be there to back you up. They're convinced that the universe must know what's happening at any given moment on any of its levels. From galaxy clusters to individuals to elementary particles. In other words, reality exists everywhere and at all times. It's just that we aren't quick enough to see for ourselves. Unless you're present during the search and rescue of the site of the explosion, there already are dead bodies and survivors, not some strange half-dead people. In the end, even away from scientists' prying eyes, photons and electrons from atoms must have strictly defined parameters. And although it is indeed a must with them, in our universe, it's a little bit different. Einstein's realism found its staunch opponent in the already familiar discoverer of the atomic model Niels Bohr. You see, by 1927, the famous double-slit experiments had already proven that neither photons nor electrons can decide whether they're waves or particles, choosing to be both things at once, with a certain degree of probability for each option. But the thing that Einstein, the realist, was scared of most was the titular quantum entanglement. Scientists had noticed long ago that particles generated by one source can display interrelated characteristics. If one of them measures quantum spin at one, the other will have it at minus one by definition, even if no measures are taken. Besides, it becomes instantly clear at any distance. It's as if they're bound with an invisible thread and it remains there even if the particles end up at completely different points on the U.S. map. Niels Bohr claimed that quantum spin wasn't predefined and only assumes one of the two values at the moment it's measured. So the universe plays dice with its own micro-reality. On the plus side, as soon as you measure the parameter of one entangled particle, you'll instantly know the other's value. Einstein had one more reason to dislike such indeterminacy. In certain circumstances, the information about one particle would be transmitted to the other one faster than light. Einstein called that spooky action at a distance and announced that none of that was possible whatsoever. According to his theory, particles know their conditions from the start and do well enough without all those random events and spooky actions. It's just that particles' real characteristics are hidden from us, he said, just like people under the rubble after the catastrophe. When rescuers find them, they only find out their already accomplished status, and the same applies to those who experiment with quantum entangled particles. 
the dispute between Einstein and Bohr was never resolved, but there just had to be a way to determine if the hidden variables were real. In 1964, Irish physicist John Stuart Bell had an idea that would help him make the universe show its true colors. He developed a brilliant theorem. In it, two scientists, Alice and Bob, without any previous discussion, randomly changed the detector's sensitivity and thus either spot entangled particles or not. It all boils down to the researchers' measurements either being the same or not. According to Bell's calculations, if Einstein was right and particles did hide their values from the beginning, Alice and Bob would agree in 75% of cases at most. But if Niels Bohr was right and the universe doesn't know particle spin states until the last moment, Alice and Bob's results in further iterations will match in 85% of cases. But Bell's brilliant theorem was challenging to turn into a specific experiment worthy of a Nobel Prize. Years went on, and while physicists pored over their devices, astronomers probed space and detected a paradoxical object predicted by the realist Einstein. It was the first black hole, the very existence of which challenges what's been perceived as the universe's fundamental characteristic. How did Einstein's brilliant insights destroy time in the usual sense for us? It's hardly ever occurred to you that when you're doing something as simple as crossing a road for someone in another galaxy, you instantaneously get a hundred years older. And if you want to take some years off, fly around a black hole's orbit while well, everyone on Earth is getting older. Such ideas about time would have infuriated Sir Isaac Newton, the Einstein of the 17th century. He perceived time as a counter applicable to the entire universe, anywhere at all be it on Earth's surface or on Jupiter's orbit or somewhere in faraway space. One second was always to remain one second. More importantly, all the locations in the universe were unified in a single now. Oh, and what a simple and intuitive worldview it was. But then another genius of the era, Gottfried Leibniz presented Newton with a rather uncomfortable question. Namely, what would happen to time if we removed all matter from the universe? Newton replied that time would go on as if nothing had happened. But Leibniz was convinced that if everything that could experience time disappeared, time would disappear too. In other words, he claimed that time was relative. Newton didn't hesitate to call it nonsense and used all his levers in the scientific world to muffle Leibniz's ideas. However, 200 years later, James Clerk Maxwell presented his revolutionary equations to the world. They offered a complete description of electromagnetism, and scientists spotted a spooky oddity in them. What mattered in these formulas was only the changing of time and not at all its direction. Simply put, when two electrons collide and bounce apart because their charges are the same and repel each other, you can painlessly rewind time without breaking the laws of electromagnetism. Moreover, if you only watch interactions between electrons, you'll never know in which direction time is moving. You'll only know that it's changing, and this relativity of time inspired Albert Einstein's theories. But he didn't stop there. Einstein guessed that time was not Newton's universal counter at all, but a floating parameter that strongly depends on the context, just as Leibniz predicted. What matters the most for your clock is where exactly you are in space. Massive objects warp the very fabric of the universe, so an astronaut in deep space will think that clocks on Earth and Jupiter are only slightly behind. But for those on Earth, well, one second there will last as usual. It will last a bit shorter on Jupiter, and the astronaut's clock will be slightly ahead. And if we send the poor thing to the black hole, one second for them may turn into a hundred seconds on Earth, potentially creating years of difference. The same effect will ensue if the astronaut travels in a spaceship nearing the speed of light. All of this means that, for one reason or another, there's no single now in the universe. The answers will change depending on whom you ask, and everyone will be right in their own way. Einstein's theory suggests that if a spaceship actively maneuvers, slowing down and accelerating in turns, an outside observer will see its now jump in time no worse than the heroes of Back to the Future. 
Besides, with a proper observation point, a huge shift won't even require any acceleration. From a galaxy at the edge of the observable universe, which is moving away from Earth at an incredible speed itself, your 10-second road crossing will become a 100-year leap, and your now will seesaw each time you change the direction. Newton would have been appalled. Apparently, time doesn't exist by itself and is always relative to objects in space. But the physicists of the past would be even more befuddled by experiments with quantum entanglement. By 1972, American physicist John Clauser had found a way to test Bell's theorem and the strange quantum physics postulates about non-existent reality. Rather than checking entangled electron spin values, he tested photons' polarization, that is, the relative lengths of their waves in space. In the physicist's experiment, Alice and Bob were separately turning their detectors. This had only two outcomes. Either photons were detected on both sides, or because of the detector's settings, manifested on neither of them. And in other cases, the results, of course, did not match. If Einstein was right about the hidden but predefined variables of photons, then there wouldn't be more than 75% of matches. But John Clauser's experiment showed him that the ratio of matches and mismatches was even higher than 85 to 15%. Bell's theorem was proven, and with it, the fact that when it comes to individual particles, the universe just doesn't have any definite reality. But Einstein's followers still had one loophole. The thing is, how Alice and Bob turned their detectors just couldn't be absolutely random. So what if the hidden variables of reality were contained not in photons themselves, but in the experimenter's manipulations with particle detectors? This observer effect can be applied to the entire universe, too. What if the reality surrounding us is a product of our own actions? Today, no one doubts the Big Bang Theory. But what if it didn't exist until we guessed it happened in the distant past? Wow, this may sound like one of these crackpot ideas all of us hit on when we can't fall asleep for a little too long. But actually, it was the idea vigorously promoted by the father of quantum physics, Niels Bohr. In his opinion, by watching the experiment, a person doesn't just make particles identify their variables, but also makes them real. Moreover, as soon as a scientist closes the lab and goes out for lunch, everything in there ceases to exist. All the particles, the detectors, and the lab itself. Such an extreme opinion about reality was so frustrating to Albert Einstein that he even snapped at Bohr's assistant, asking, Do you really believe the moon isn't there when you're not looking at it? And, oh, the audacity. The quantum theorists answered positively. John Archibald Wheeler was a mentee of Niels Bohr. At first, it was one of the proverbial student surpasses teacher cases when it came to strange ideas. In the late 40s, he half-jokingly suggested that there's only one electron in the entire universe. According to him, firstly, these particles are identical and might well be the same object. And secondly, the familiar negatively charged electron that travels from the past to the future with us, should time be reversed, would look to us just like the positively charged positron. Ergo, one electron might well leap back and forth in time to compose every atom on Earth one by one. Sounds wild, but physics doesn't forbid this scenario. But John Wheeler's imagination was eventually captivated by an even bolder theory related to the very nature of reality. It was that of a participatory universe. The theory says that the laws of physics are as involved in the creation of reality as its observers. That is, you and I. Wheeler himself compared it to the old game of 20 questions. Alice chooses an object, and Bob must guess what it is by asking him simple yes or no questions. If the questions are well thought out and precise enough, an experienced player can easily guess the object in even fewer than 20 moves. That's what we would believe our interaction with reality might be like, with one significant difference. When the universe itself answers Bob's questions, it doesn't really play fair and its yeses and noes are completely random because it actually didn't even think of any object to be guessed. And still, the contents of Bob's questions alone are enough for the universe to provide a definitive answer. 
So it seems that it knew from the very beginning that it chose this and not anything else. Wheeler called this principle it from bit, implying that simple questions and binary answers like yes or no can practically create the universe's reality out of nothing, and even retrospectively. This means that, say, the moon appeared not billions of years ago, but at just the moment someone on Earth looked up and asked the universe, do I see a huge round thing up there? Similarly, the Big Bang of the distant past was created by 20th century scientists as soon as they thought of asking the right questions about galaxies flying in all directions. But how come all of us share one common reality? According to Wheeler, the universe has the reality that gives the best and most precise answers to the questions of all observers at once. To put it roughly, what we see around us is our collective creation. And if you're the only one to suddenly decide that the Big Bang never happened, you won't have the power to change reality. But if this is true, who has the right to ask questions to the universe? Is it only intelligent beings like people who can boast such a high status? Or were dogs also able to call the moon to reality by howling at it for the first time? And what about the film that was used to take photos of it? This contradiction turned out to be the participatory universe's weakest point. Wheeler was never able to finalize his potentially revolutionary theory during his lifetime. The overpowered observers complicated matters in the Nobel-winning experiments with quantum entanglement. Ten years was what it took French scientist Alain Aspect to completely exclude the experimenter from the experiment. At its core, the photon experiment remained the same. What Aspect did differently was put several detectors with fixed presets on each side, and in front of them, he placed special quartz crystals. Their purpose was to deflect photons to this or that detector in a way that wasn't dependent on a human, keeping entanglement intact. The results could just as easily be compared with Bell's theory. That is, it was possible to count the resulting match rate knowing for sure that those matches weren't induced by physicists themselves. Aspect took lots of measurements and proved even more convincingly that the universe is not real at the particle level until it's measured and forced to make a choice. This would be the question to ask the universe for John Wheeler. But even though Aspect succeeded with his crystals, Einstein's followers had one last hope to cling to. What if the hidden variables that told the particles how to behave were lurking within the quartz crystals themselves? It seems that no matter how many times scientists try to probe the universe's core, it's always capable of coming up with a new ambiguous excuse on the fly. It's as if one objective reality didn't exist, not just at the particle level. But then, what will remain of our world? In recent years, more and more scientists have been inclined to believe that instead of reality, we're surrounded by phantoms. In 2015, cognitive psychologist Donald Hoffman of the University of California published an article in which he proposed the so-called interface theory. Right now, you're watching this video on the screen of your computer or smartphone. You can see how many minutes and seconds have passed since the video started, and you can pause and rewind if you don't catch something the first time. Don't get me wrong, I'm not judging you here. The entire interface you're interacting with is generated by processors in your device. But can you find out how exactly they work if you only see the pixels on your screen? Donald Hoffman asked, what if even when we look up from our gadgets, we still see the same interface of the universe created by ourselves? And what if this interface doesn't at all reflect what the universe really is? But then, don't our eyes only perceive the teeniest bit of the spectrum of electromagnetic waves that pierce the entire universe? I mean, it's less than a hundredth of a percent. No matter how hard you try, you won't see the Wi-Fi signal in your room, and if your neighbor's connected to it on the sly, just because our human interface doesn't display these waves. Donald Hoffman believes that humans evolved to perceive things this way in order to survive. Color vision was vital for our ancestors because it allowed them to spot a tiger in the jungle. But they never had to face radiation, which is no less dangerous. And so now we need special tools to see it during man-made disasters. So our human interface is in no way suitable for studying the universe's actual reality. 
But the fundamental properties of the universe sometimes show through the mist of our imperfect perception, casting even more doubt on its reality. On the brink of the 20th century, German physicist Max Planck decided to derive units of measurement that wouldn't depend on the habitual meters or feet, but would follow the objective properties of the universe itself. The main result of this search was the so-called Planck length, based on three fundamental constants of nature. This distance is so short that even if we enlarge the atom to the size of the whole Earth, we still wouldn't be able to pick out the Planck length, which would be thinner than a hair. Working from this unit, the German physicist also derived the Planck time. This is how much a photon needs to pass one Planck length. That is very, very little. But these units, highly impractical at our level, are not some scientific oddity. Essentially, Planck derived, as it were, the minimum resolution of space and time, with any known physical laws ceasing to work past this point. Actually, the universe itself seems to lose any sense then. Some metaphorically call these pixels making up space-time itself as if it were an image on your screen. So what if Planck really got to the bottom of the interface of our not-quite-real universe? But what really scares scientists is this enigmatic number. The so-called fine structure constant very nearly equal to 137th. Not meters, not seconds, not anything really. It's just a strange coefficient that pops up in all kinds of formulas. Everything looks like the fine structure constant underlies almost all interactions in our universe. If it had equaled anything else, not just life would have never existed, neither would atoms. At the same time, physicists have no idea why its value is 137th, as if someone just programmed it that way. In 2003, all these strange things about the universe inspired Swedish philosopher Nick Bostrom, who suggested a simulation hypothesis. Put in the simplest way possible, it suggests that if the universe allows the existence of civilizations operating extremely powerful supercomputers and capable of digitalizing minds, then it's quite probable that we live in their simulation. And if the resolution in such matrices is really as small as Planck parameters suggest, then emulating the universe on such a scale and with such quality requires a computer that's much bigger than the universe itself. But physicists are critical of Bostrom's hypothesis not because it's too fantastical for them, but because it's scientifically impractical. We would have to acknowledge our inability to understand the real world, ceasing all our search for truth. But when has that ever stopped Nobel Prize laureates? In the late 90s, Austrian physicist Anton Zellinger managed to refine quantum entanglement experiments so that they reached their logical conclusion. He enhanced Alain Aspect's setup with superfast random number generators that regulated the quartz crystal's conducting abilities. In other words, Zellinger blocked all the ways in for Einstein's hidden variables and conclusively proved that on a quantum scale, the universe is indeed unreal. This makes it somewhat similar to a video game, where small details don't load until the player looks at them or comes close enough. In this light, it's especially interesting that Anton Zellinger is also considered the creator of quantum teleportation. He invented a feasible way to transmit undefined states of particles to other particles over long distances. This was a major step toward creating super-powerful quantum computers that, while relatively small, might be millions of times more efficient than our ordinary hardware. So what if this can prove Bostrom's simulation hypothesis? Perhaps we'll eventually grow to be a civilization that will create a simulation of the universe with its ancestors. Or has it already happened? And we are only repeating their technological development within the simulation. I have one last theory for you that makes our world absolutely real and, at the same time, doesn't defy the experiments of the three Nobel Prize winners. It's super determinism. It proclaims that only time is an illusion and that all the events in the universe have already happened. In other words, we're not moving into an indefinite future, but rather watching a pre-recorded movie about the life of the universe. In a world like this, experiments with quantum entanglement contain hidden variables, only those are written into the very script of the universe. 
and no new experience will be able to manifest them because it will also be part of this unchanging and pre-planned sequence of events. Except superdeterminism requires us to face a big existential problem. There's no free will in it. So, which do you like more? A not-so-real though slightly controllable universe or the role of a thoughtless puppet whose movements were scripted in advance.